This is the Sydney Writers' Festival event. I'm Ramona Koval from ABC Radio National's Book Show. And it's my really great pleasure to be in conversation with Alex Ross, who's achieved the remarkable feat in the writing of this first book called The Rest is Noise. It's subtitled Listening to the 20th Century. And it's remarkable because you not only read about listening to the music of the last century, you actually almost hear it too when you're, when you're reading it. Since 1996, Alex Ross has been writing music reviews and criticism as a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine. Before that, he was music critic for the New York Times. He wrote for lots of other journals. He's been a DJ playing classical music for a college radio station, studied English literature as well as piano and composition. This first book not only became a bestseller, it won a National Book Critics Circle Award and the Guardian First Book Award. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer and the Samuel Johnson Prizes. It appeared on the New York Times list of the 10 best books of 2007. Um, the Royal Philharmonic Society of England has just given its Creative Communication Award to um, The Rest is Noise, both the book and Alex's blog. And the Manhattan School of Music has just given him an honorary doctorate in musical arts. And look how young he is. <laughs> <laughs> so we're beginning tonight with a reading from The Rest is Noise. Please welcome Alex Ross to Sydney. Well, thank you, Ramona, and thank you all for coming out. And just thought I'd give you... Uh, a uh, brief sampling of the book uh, with a tiny bit of um, musical accompaniment. May 29, 1913 was an unusually hot day for Paris in the spring. The temperature reached 85 degrees. By late afternoon, a crowd had gathered in front of the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées on the Avenue Montaigne, where Serge Diaghilev's Ballet Russe was holding its spring gala. Jean Cocteau, then 23, recalled, there for the expert eye were all the makings of a scandal, a fashionable audience in décolletage outfitted in pearls, egret headdresses, plumes of ostrich, and side by side with the tails and feathers, the jackets, headbands, and showy rags of that race of esthetes who randomly acclaim the new in order to express their hatred of the loge, a thousand nuances of snobbery, super snobbery, counter snobbery. <laughs> the better heeled part of the crowd had grown wary of Diaghilev's methods. Disquieting rumors were circulating about the new musical work on the program, The Rite of Spring, by the young Russian composer Igor Stravinsky, and also about the matching choreography by Nijinsky. The theater, then brand new, caused a scandal of its own. With its steel concrete exterior and amphitheater-like seating plan, it was deemed too severe, too Germanic. One commentator compared it to a zeppelin moored in the middle of the street. Diaghilev, in a press release, promised a new thrill that will doubtless inspire heated discussion. He did not lie. The program began not innocuously with a revival of the Ballet Russe's Chopin fantasy Les Sophides. After a pause, the theater darkened again, and high, falsetto-like bassoon notes floated out of the orchestra, strands of melody intertwined like vegetation bursting out of the earth. A sacred terror in the noonday sun, Stravinsky called it in a description that had been published that morning. The audience listened to the opening section of the rite in relative silence, although the, although the increasing density and dissonance of the music caused mutterings, titters, whistles, and shouts. Then at the beginning of the second section, a dance for adolescents titled The Augurs of Spring, a quadruple shock arrived in the form of harmony, rhythm, image, and movement. At the outset of the section, the strings and horns play a crunching discord consisting of an F-flat major triad and an E-flat dominant seventh superimposed. They are one semitone apart, and they clash at every node. A steady pulse propels the chord, but accents land, land every which way on and off the beat. Diaghilev quivered a little when he first heard the music. 
Will it last a very long time this way? He asked. Stravinsky replied, Till the end, my dear. The chord repeats some 200 times. Meanwhile, Nijinsky's choreography discarded classical gestures in favor of near anarchy. As the ballet historian Lynn Garofolo recounts, the dancers trembled, shook, shivered, stamped, jumped crudely and ferociously, circled the stage in wild corvodes. Behind the dancers were pagan landscapes painted by Nicholas Rorick, hills and trees of weirdly bright color, shapes from a dream. Howls of discontent went up from the boxes where the wealthiest onlookers sat. Immediately, the esthetes in the balconies in the standing room howled back. There were overtones of class warfare in the proceedings. The combative composer Florent Schmitt was heard to yell either, Shut up, bitches of the 16e, or down with the whores of the 16e, a provocation of the Grande Dame of the 16th arrondissement. The literary hostess Jean Mühlfeld, not to be outmaneuvered, exploded into contemptuous laughter. Little more of the score was heard after that. Gertrude Stein recalled, one literally could not, throughout the performance, hear the sound of music. Our attention was constantly distracted by a man in the box next to us, flourishing his cane, and finally, in a violent altercation with an enthusiast in the box next to him, his cane came down and smashed the opera hat the other had just put on in defiance. It was all incredibly fierce. The scene superficially resembled Arnold Schoenberg's Scandal concert, which shook up Vienna in March of the same year, but the bedlam on the Avenue Montaigne was a typical Parisian affair of a kind that took place once or twice a year. Nijinsky's orgasmic prelude to the afternoon of a fawn had caused similar trouble the previous season. Soon enough, Parisian listeners realized that the language of the right was not so unfamiliar. It teemed with plain-spoken folk song melodies, common chords and sparring layers, syncopations of irresistible potency. In a matter of days, confusion turned, confusion turned into pleasure, booze into bravos. Even at the first performance, Stravinsky, Nijinsky, and the dancers had to bow four or five times for the benefit of the applauding faction. Subsequent performances were packed, and at each one, the opposition dwindled. At the second, there was noise only during the latter part of the ballet. At the third, vigorous applause and little protest. At a concert performance of the right one year later, unprecedented exaltation and a fever of adoration swept over the crowd, and admirers mobbed Stravinsky in the street afterward in a riot of delight. So you can see, you can hear from that, you know, the, um, the music behind it. Um, even if you didn't hear that music, you would have been able to hear it. Um, you begin, Alex, the book with um, a, a performance of Strauss's opera Salome on March the 16th, 1906 in Graz, um, an adaptation of the play by the notorious Oscar Wilde. And the crowd roars its approval. Um, one person writes, nothing more satanic and artistic has been seen on the German opera stage. And, and this reading you've done, um, the reception for the Rite of Spring, it's either huge praise or terrible condemnation. Um, some performances that you describe at that time uh, generate physical scuffles, a trial for assault. What is going on there? Why... why why was the work of composers of the time uh, so um, generative of such passion? It's almost weird to think of it now from where we sit. Right. Well, of course, we all know the stories of the, the general outcry that greeted uh, you know, various uh, modernistic gestures in all the art forms, whether it's you know, the publication of Ulysses um, or you know, the first exhibitions of abstract painting, uh, Duchamp and Picasso, and, and you know, the whole string of scandals, N Nijinsky's choreography. Some people say it was actually more shocking to the crowd on the occasion of that uh, 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 famous performance in Paris than Stravinsky's music. Um, so across the board, uh, um, disorder and, and discontent uh, being caused by these great leap, leaps forward uh, of modernism in the arts. But there was something especially acute, I think, about what happened in music um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, music had become so monumental, and um, the, the romantic composers 
were, were towering figures, uh, very popular figures. I mean, if you remember um, the, the vast crowds that uh, came out in the streets when, when Verdi died, uh, the, the enormous adulation and, and fascination for Wagner after his death, growing and growing. So uh, music was very central, composers were very central. And when there was this sudden sharp turn uh, toward increased dissonance um, and, uh, or, or sort of you know, emphasis uh, on unusual rhythms and, and these sort of potent rhythms that, that appear in uh, Stravinsky's music, um, then, yeah, audiences reacted very strongly to what seemed to, to some like the desecration of these, these temples of music. And I also think that um, listening is actually a, a physical activity because, you know, sound... Uh, really is a, a, a shaking of the air, which you know directly uh, affects our bodies. I mean, I think we listen with our, our bodies as well as our minds, and so these potent rhythms, these jarring chords, really got under people's skin. I think in, in, in a more acute way, a more lasting way than than the other uh, art forms, because you see in painting the initial shock, the initial upset. Then, as the years go by, these painters become uh, massively popular. Uh, Jackson Pollock paintings, which were once considered you know ridiculous, you know a man splashing paint, paint randomly on a canvas, um, now going for a hundred million dollars on the art market today, vast sums of money, huge crowds turning out for museums. Whereas, if you put on uh, a concert of, uh, well, Stravinsky goes over quite well these days, but um, uh, Schoenberg still causes a bit of unease. John Cage, Morton Feldman uh, can, can really still be something of a shock to audiences. So it's an ongoing project, an ongoing problem. Uh, you know, why do we um, treat sound differently? And, you know, I think one major mission that I had with this book was to, to get people to look at this and modern music, listen to it uh, in a different way, and sort of come at it from, from the same angle as, as people do you know, the other art forms. So um, sound being such a physically invasive mm-hmm. um, form that, you know, um, we wonder why minor scales make us cry. And, but it, but if, you know, if the atonality is actually making us mad, making us angry, making us want to stop it, that's quite, um, quite uh, a, a courageous thing, isn't mm-hmm. it, for those people to have started to do? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, Schoenberg, who is considered generally the inventor of, of atonality, uh, who uh, really first went over the brink in, in, into this sort of new realm where, where all of the familiar chords had, had more or less gone missing, and, and he was presenting these, these radical new combinations of tones... Um, he could have, you know, very easily had a, a successful career um, writing in a, in a late romantic manner, and, and he did so. With, and he was uh, okay, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was very skilled, uh, and um, he had a, uh, one of the great ironic moments in sort of the early history of modern music was the premiere of his piece, Guru Leader, uh, which was in this sort of massive, monumental, post-Wagnerian manner sumptuously orchestrated and uh, there was this this triumphant premiere where uh, there was sort of you know uh, ovation after ovation but th- that was in 1913 and, and that was several years after Schoenberg had had taken the, the drastic step into atonality he'd, he'd sketched the piece uh, uh, sometime before and he found that experience thoroughly alienating because he, he knew that audiences were acclaiming a style of music that he no longer believed in uh, and you know, he had seen what happened you know, when, how crowds reacted um, to his, his newer ideas and uh, really kind of a, a very um, ironic and, and it was a dark moment in his life, that but triumph from premiere, because they were acclaiming the, what he thought was the, the wrong music. Well, this seemed to be a thing that he did most of his life, because you know, later on you write that um, uh, he understood later on that he was being elevated as a patron saint of a newly militant avant-garde mentality mm-hmm. with whose uh, premises he did not agree. So he didn't like being, you know, having a whole lot of um, Schoenberg aficionados and worshippers. Yeah, well, he, I think he did and he didn't. You know, it, it, he was um, uh, he, he he had disciples um, throughout his life, and uh, he 
appreciated and, and really encouraged, uh, almost you know, enforced a certain loyalty uh, from those disciples. Um, but he was a brilliant teacher, and, and he sort of produced uh, two of the, uh, of the great composers of 20th century music, uh, Alban Berg and Anton Webern. Uh, Berg, in particular, was a composer with uh, very little uh, experience, and, and, and Schoenberg uh, disciplined his talent so that, so that Berg, uh, without Schoenberg, it's, it's almost unimaginable that, that Berg could have gone on to write Wozzeck and, and Lulu and, and this string of masterpieces. And, um, but what happened was, I mean, he was a, he was a contrarian and, and so sort of uh, independent an individual in his thinking. So as the years went by and these ideas that had initially been rejected acquired you know, a strong intellectual following, especially after the Second World War and 12-tone writing, uh, the, which emerged from uh, atonality, was embraced as, you know, almost the new standard international language for music. Uh, Schoenberg really reacted against that because it was too, you know, he didn't, he didn't really want to, to, to produce um, an, an official language. And he also didn't like this, this idea that, that um, his music would be turned into some kind of Dogma. Uh, and he wasn't. That would be he didn't want to be a theoretician. Against, yeah, and he also he didn't he didn't really you know he also loved uh, certain pieces by uh, uh, Sibelius and and, and uh, uh, Shostakovich or or at least appreciated them um, uh, if not uh, loved them and he didn't want to see I think modern music turning into camps of, of sort of one group attacking another and uh, you know a wonderfully complex figure I mentioned him more often than, than any other in the book, and he keeps sort of popping up in, in one place or another, and uh, uh, I think it remains uh, a fascinating inspiration for composers today. You, you, you said that he said, though, that Strauss was the true revolutionary. Right, well, that was a sort of a probably somewhat ironic comment that, that he made, because, um, I mean, he didn't like being labeled uh, a revolutionary either, and, and he was saying... Richard Strauss, who we now think of as a rather conservative figure, he, uh, Schoenberg was correctly pointing out, you know, circa 1900, 1905, Strauss was just about the most radical composer who was out there, and uh, really admitting that that uh, certain of uh, certain dissonances, certain uh, very uh, unusual and spooky uh, orchestral timbres, uh, sort of all kinds of effects. Uh, had first appeared in Strauss's music, and then they spread to um, Schoenberg and, and, and the music of his pupils, Berg and Webern. Um, you know, at the same time, I think Schoenberg was saying, you know, Strauss was, was merely a revolutionary, perhaps, and merely a kind of inventor of sounds, maybe not a, a truly great, deep musical thinker, as Schoenberg himself <laughs> presumably was. Uh, so uh, another sort of very complex uh, comment that's sort of uh, hard to... Uh, down. Well, actually, at the very beginning of the book, you have um, Strauss and, and uh, uh, Mahler going for a walk before the uh, before the uh, performance um, mm-hmm. uh, of Salome, and you say the split between them, their friendship, the split between them, forecast a larger division in 20th century music to come between the between modernist and popular conception of the composer's role, mm-hmm. and this is something that really uh, comes through the book. What was that split? Well, I think you can you can just sort of begin to see it emerging with with Strauss and Mahler, uh, who were in the end both I think uh, uh, very similar in, in terms of how they viewed this whole question of um, originality and and sort of you know, revolutionary tendencies in in, in music and, and modernistic tendencies, and then you know, what the crowd wants and, and, and what sort of the mass audience wants. And they were both actually masters at, at, at sort of finding a, a middle ground um, in, in very different ways. They were very different personalities. But I think in the end, if you look back, you know, their greatest works, you know, whether it's Strauss's Salome and Electra or, or Mahler's uh, Sixth Symphony, Eighth Symphony, there's a certain uh, balance act, a balancing act um, between sort of the, the radical on the one hand, and, and something much more sort of reassuringly familiar and sort of veering uh, back and forth between one or the other. But uh, Mahler was probably, the, there was something more uh, pure and idealistic in, in Mahler's thinking. Strauss is more sort of pragmatist and a compromiser. And I think there, that's, that's when you can see this, this split beginning to open up between, you know, essentially composers who, who are 
still writing for you know uh, a presumed mass audience and, and those who have the, the modernist uh, attitude, uh, attitude of um, you know essentially let's write purely what's what's in our minds but what we think is right and and, and perhaps uh, an audience will emerge. I think it's it's actually something of a of a false split because you know, every composer wants an audience. Um, and you know, there could be a composer who's writing something that, that does prove to have massive, mass appeal, but that doesn't mean that, that they're um, uh, sort of pandering. You know, it, 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 they may, you know, compose, really major composers have no choice uh, but to write the sounds that, that they hear in their head, you know, whether they, they seem radical or, or mm-hmm. conservative. So yeah, I think that's a, something of a of a false split, and, and one thing I really wanted to do with this book was to bring all these composers together, who are just very often, you know, not in, in you know, between the covers of a single book, uh, from the sort of both the radical and conservative ends of the spectrum. You've got a lovely paragraph on composing being a difficult business, a child of loneliness that lives off crowds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking of Sibelius um, when when I wrote that because. You know, here's here's an example of someone. You know, Sibelius was immensely popular in his lifetime. You know, when he was still a young man, he was acclaimed as the great Finnish national hero. Who's the most famous Finn? You know, who had ever lived up to that point, and maybe remains so today. And um, then his music spread to uh, Europe and, and England and America, and, and proved to have. Great mass appeal at some point in the 1920s. He was voted the most popular living symphonist um, in America, and, and the symphonies are being performed almost as often as Beethoven's. But Sibelius was was a, a very lonely man, a very troubled man in a lot of ways. Uh, he was not pandering to to a mass audience. He was fiercely independent in his thinking, especially his later music. It's, it's quite radical stuff in terms of the orchestration, in terms of how he um, lets his ideas kind of dissolve away into these heaving, mysterious textures in the orchestra, and they sort of emerge and, and dissolve again. And you know, he, he was seen as, as a very conservative figure in his day, and he's sort of been rediscovered in a very interesting twist as a secret radical. And, and a lot of younger composers right now who see him as just this, this enormously uh, inventive and, and inspirational figure in terms of how he uses the orchestra and, and these ideas of, of texture and, and, and timbre. But, but you also describe um, one a performance um, of, of his work that was, was greeted with sort of the Finnish version of shock and horror, which they went all quiet. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so there's yeah. no writing. Yeah, a riot of silence. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, that was the fourth symphony. And the fourth symphony is a very dark uh, and disturbing work. I think one of the, the bleakest works of the 20th century um, because uh, it, um, it, it just sort of takes you on this uh, labyrinthine journey from which there's really no escape. You sort of end on an even bleaker uh, uh, kind of tone than, than, than how it began. Well, maybe silence is the only... Proper response. Probably yes. I mean, you know, hard. You know, who knows what, what people what, were thinking? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. What do we know about what he thought about the response? I'm not sure, actually. I, I think he he knew. I mean, I think he knew when he wrote that piece that this was not something that was going to go over big like his second symphony and and be seen as a, uh, a sort of symbol of heroic national spirit. Uh, so I, I'm sure he wasn't expecting uh, that that kind of response. Just before I leave eternality, I've just noticed a note I've made about the first mention of atonality in Sumerian clay tablets from Ur. <laughs> what, what did they say? Well, that wasn't, that wasn't about atonality per se. I mean, that's about <clears throat> um, this sort of, well, this dissonance is, um, yeah. and this idea that sort of, you know, uh, certain intervals, um, you know, going back centuries and, and millennia, have been heard as, uh, as being sort of um, more peculiar and, and more unsettling than others. And, and I think um, uh, scientists and uh, sort of neuroscientists and, and, uh, and, and musicologists and, and various other people continue to argue over, you know, is, is there something um, in a way 
natural and, and deep-seated uh, about um, uh, certain intervals, you know, the, the octave and the, the perfect fifth and the major third. Uh, in, in certain cultures, yes, they, they seem sort of absolutely universal in their sense of, you know, you hear them like, ah, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's nice. And then um, other um, combinations of um, intervals, the tritone, uh, going back to, to medieval times, was seen as having a, a diabolical uh, association. And then the, the semitone, which is if you take you know, two, any two notes on the piano that are, that are right next to each other um, and play them simultaneously, you get this, this jarring sound, and it's almost universally understood to be, ooh, you know, there's, there's something uh, strange about that. But then, but there is, you know, variation. You know, certain, you know, certain cultures um, around uh, the world. I mean, sort of tunings are are sort of constantly changing as you go from one culture to another, and and, and certain you know combinations that you know seem very pleasing to one society and, and aren't so to to others. So actually, I think it, in the end, it is hard, you know, difficult to settle on some idea of you know what's universally correct. And and you know uh, you know which chords are sort of universally lovely, and, and I think that tells you something about how you know we we shouldn't be so certain, um, uh, and we should be you know open to the possibility that that, that a sound that that we think is um, noise uh, you know might turn out to have great beauty um, uh, hidden in it, which is the, that's the thinking under underlying the title of this book. The rest is noise. Um, I'm talking about the perception that a lot of people have that something went wrong with classical music in the 20th century and, and it did veer from, from beauty uh, into noise uh, and that it all, it all sort of petered out or, or, or kind of you know, devolved into chaos. Uh, and it's an, an ironic title, actually, because I think there's, there's an enormous uh, amount of beauty here of, of all different kinds. And if you go back and listen again, you, you might begin to discover the, the beauty and the noise. And how lucky for musicologists that you found that Sumerian clay tablet from Ur that use those clay tablets they usually have lists of cows <laughs> and stuff that people buy isn't it marvelous that you've got some reference to to music yeah well, we don't know I mean it's so interesting about sort of the ancient cultures we just don't know what what the music uh, sounded like I mean, there's a lot of speculation what did ancient Greek music uh, really sound like and there have been attempts to um, reconstruct it but the notation doesn't tell us quite enough um, about you know how how it really went and and so I mean it's only the notated music that we can really be absolutely sure of what it sounds like only goes back a thousand years or so.